Dear audience, welcome back. A friendly reminder that you can also join the debate on social media with the hashtag EIF21. Our next discussion will be about Europe's role in the great power competition. And before diving into the topic with our experts, I invite you to answer the following Slido poll with the code EIF21. In today's great power competition, Europe's place is... To tackle this and other points, I'd like to introduce Roland Freundenstein, Policy Director of the Martin Center, who will moderate the upcoming panel. Roland, over to you. Thank you, Anna, and uh, welcome also from uh, my own side. Uh, so I'm Roland Freudenstein, the Policy Director of the Martin Center, and uh, I'm happy to have with me in the studio here Roberta Mezzola from Malta, member of the European Parliament, actually Vice President of the European Parliament, and uh, member of the EPP group there. Um, online, uh, we have uh, Alexander Stubb, who is the director of the School of Transnational Governance of the European University Institute in Florence currently, but also a former member of the European Parliament and last but by no means least a former Finnish Prime Minister. We also have Margareta Sederfeldt from Sweden, a member of the Swedish Parliament, the Riksdag, and uh, Vice President of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly and uh, President of the EPP Group there. Uh, further, we have Noah Barkin from the United States, Senior Visiting Fellow of the Asia Programme uh, at the German Marshall Fund of the United States and with the Rhodium Group, an expert in uh, especially the Euro-Chinese relationship. Um, so, uh, when I was preparing for this, I was tempted to strike a note of modesty, but then I thought better of it. <laughs> Uh, let's start with a bit of bombast here, and uh, for that I am uh, going to read you a quote from 2009 of Mark Leonard. Uh, Mark Leonard, the founder of the European Council of Foreign Relations, in his book, What Does China Think? And he starts out the book with the following lines. Very few things that happened during my lifetime will be remembered after I'm dead. Even 9-11 or the Iraq war, and you know, seen from today, he might as well have added the corona pandemic. So all these things will gradually fade until they become mere footnotes in the history books. But China's rise is different. It is the big story of our age, and its after effects could echo down generations to come. Now, you must admit, uh, this is a quite uh, an entry into our topic. But actually, while we do want to uh, focus on uh, Europe, America, China, democracies, and so on, I would like to take a step back and start actually with transatlantic relations. Because, you know, um, the rise of China may, may be the big strategic story of our age. But the immediate news of the last couple of months, actually, was the improvement in transatlantic relations. And I would actually like to kick off with Alexander Stubb and ask him, um, you, when I looked at some of your, your uh, speeches and lectures on YouTube, you used to speak of a power vacuum in the last couple of years. And power vacuum, especially when uh, talking about defending the global liberal order. So with Joe Biden in the White House, is that vacuum being filled again? Is the West back, so to speak? Over to you, Alexander. Thanks a lot, Roland, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. I'm actually catching you from the Finnish archipelago, which Roberta will know well, here in Porkala, which we had to give to the Soviet Union after. Soviet Union after World War II for rental and got it back in 1956 and we're now happily hanging out here with plus 28 degrees and sunshine as we often do um, here in Finland. Um, to give you a direct answer uh, is yes and no. Um, let me put it this way. I think that at this particular moment we have moved from a world of disorder and power vacuums to three clear power blocks. Number one, China, number two, the United States, and number three, the European Union. 
All of these three blocks uh, are different in character. Obviously, the United States and Europe are both democracies, but the United States is by definition a, a state, whereas the European Union is more than an international organization, but less than a state. China is centralized politically, but decentralized uh, economically. It does not believe in traditional uh, democracy. And these three power blocks are going to be the big deciders. And if I were to give you my two cents at the moment, is to say that we basically have three different options with dealing with China. Number one uh, is to disconnect completely. This is, if I may exaggerate, the American way at the moment. Uh, the US sees China as its number one enemy. It's not a new Cold War, but the situation is similar. You need an enemy to rally around the flag uh, back home. The second option is to connect fully, both politically and economically, and say that, you know, we don't have a problem with Chinese human rights or fundamental rights. We're going to go full China, forget the United States. The third one is to try to find a balance between these two. And this is what I would advocate. I think Europe should be what I call the great stabilizer between China and the United States. And for me, a great stabilizer means that it is 75% with the United States because of our value base, because of our culture, because of our history, uh, because of our economic ties. But at the same time, if it wants to be seriously geopolitical, it has to play with China. We cannot close the door from China. So my take here, Roland, is power vacuums are being filled as we speak. Europe should be the great stabilizer between China and the United States, but tilt a little bit more with our good old friends in the US. Thank you so much, Alexander. I mean, th this is basically the answer three in the Slido poll that uh, we offered. Uh, and I'm asking you, the audience, to uh, please uh, participate in it. Um, it was so, a really uh, good point three, and I hope the audience goes for it. <laughs> and we will see about that. You know, my hopes are actually with the answer number one. But... Um, just to remind you all, it's uh, uh, so in today's great power competition, Europe's place is A, firmly at the side of the US and the other democracies of the world, B, as an independent third force outside the US-China rivalry, and C, it's complicated politically with the US, but economically concerning trade, investment, technology, independent. I might have added a fourth option, of course, like uh, siding completely with China, but I have the impression that while before the pandemic, some people were advocating this in Europe, this has become rather rare because, uh, you know, not only in the US, but also in Europe, there is a sizable shift going on in the mood vis-a-vis uh, -vis China and the mood on uh, Euro-Chinese relations. But I, I would still, Alexander, forgive me, I would come back to this initial question. Uh, is the transatlantic trans relationship back? Um, uh, uh, yes, you know, is, yes, definitely. So the answer is Definitely. Yes. I mean, you okay. know, yeah, 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 Re resoundedly. I mean, we're back to it. But remember that w w we have to play the power game here. We do not know whether Donald Trump or Joe Biden is a footnote in history. We should not exclude the possibility of another populist leader emerging, nativist leader in the United States, which means we need to find the balance between the Atlantic relationships, strategic autonomy, taking more ability. But with Joe Biden for the next four years, we'll really back. Absolutely understood. But what if Europe, through its own actions uh, in the next two years, maybe, can actually help a Bidenist approach, even in the future, with a possible successing, uh, a, a successor administration to the current one. Uh, and, you know, I'm, maybe that's a point where we can really get together uh, in saying that, look, uh, yes, we need to prepare for all possibilities, um, but Europe is not a bystander. Europe can today create facts that will make it harder in the future to decouple the US from Europe. Wouldn't that be an idea? Okay. Yes, but 
we of course would not like to with uh, U.S. elections as such. So what I'm trying to say is that we should not take for granted that Joe Sixpack on the street cares about the European Union in any which way. We should be conscious of the fact that administrations do, and administrations have a certain approach. The Biden administration is an international liberalist, globalist, multilateral administration. But what I'm saying is that on the Republican side, it's a complete mess at this moment, and we cannot trust whichever Republican president might be the one that follows after Biden or Harris or whoever that might be. So be conscious. Okay, uh, let me turn to Margareta Sederfeld um, and to the eminent question of a global struggle between democracy and authoritarianism. I mean, this has been. Uh, 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 emphasized uh, more and more intensively in, in recent years. And I think it was uh, Joe Biden uh, a year before actually the beginning of his administration when he was still campaigning um, who actually emphasized this, uh, this difference and said the big conflict of our age uh, is actually the one between these two antagonistic political systems. So my question to you is, is it right to frame the overarching international confrontation as one between democracy and authoritarianism, or aren't we risking a kind of uh, new global Cold War? And it's not only uh, the Russian and the Chinese leadership that seem to be warning about this global new Cold War, but also Chancellor Merkel recently. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Yes, uh, if uh, I'm sitting here in Vienna in a hotel room, uh, it's warm and uh, outside and the sun is shining, uh, but uh, here I am and I'm sad if the picture is not that good in the background, but that's the hotel room. Uh, yes, uh, I would like to say that uh, of course there is a conflict between democracy and totalitarianism. And we can't go behind that. But if I look from the OSCE, PA, OSCE perspective, Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, we are working with the security perspective in a very broad perspective. And I think that that's one important thing to secure uh, peace, to secure uh, freedom, fundamental freedom to secure democracy. It's also to include a big peace perspective. But back to democracy, uh, conflict, uh, totalitarianism, I think th this is a true conflict because uh, the two systems can't uh, exist uh, at the same time. Uh, I am that all that I remember very well uh, the former Soviet Union and uh, I remember, as I'm born in Sweden, in the southern part, I remember those who flew from uh, Balticum, from Poland, and uh, to Sweden, to the free Europe. And uh, I think we have, as European, uh, we have to defend democracy and we have to work for the rule-based world to secure the fundamental freedoms. Because if we don't do it, who should then do it? And we need to seek friends to cooperate with, like uh, the transatlantic uh, uh, link. I think that's also very important. Nobody can stand alone and uh, do everything alone. Just like a single European country, we have gone together with the 27 member countries in European Union, but European Union do also need to get friends to find uh, partners to work together with. And there is US, there is Canada, to mention two uh, important countries. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, it, uh, on this occasion, let me come to the, the essay that uh, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Wavrov just published in Kommersant in Russian and uh, I forget, I think the Russia Daily or so, uh, in English uh, that just came out uh, 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 yesterday. Uh, in, which, in which he precisely says that the rule, rules-based international order as postulated by the West currently uh, means just the, the rule of the West uh, and not the rule of law as he understands it. 
and he very clearly also uh, puts Russia and China ahead of a kind of global movement towards more equality between nations. Uh, the, he, he postulates also the end of the uh, Western civilization as a decisive one. It says, come on, guys, get used to it. You know, that you, you ruled the world for 500 years. It, the party is over. Um, and, and how would you comment uh, uh, this, uh, this kind of talk about the past and the future? Because I think every political conflict, every serious political disagreement is always about uh, who owns the past, who owns the future, and who is stuck in the past? And he uh, automatically, of course, he he uses this this pattern. How would you comment upon this past future thing? Uh, yes, the past future. It's it's a very interesting topic. But when I hear people, hear political leaders talk about, yes, we want to have democracy, but not in the European way. We want to have it in our way. And when I ask them, what is your way? I haven't found any, what should I say, trustable replay, because it's always something that uh, we need to secure, that it's a safe life for our citizens, uh, that I don't get offended and so on. But then who should decide about this. It does never include this, this perspective with uh, democracy or rule-based order in our way or the fundamental freedoms in our way. I haven't found any system worldwide that uh, really secure uh, the, the fundamental freedom or democracy for the citizens, for the people, when they speak about make it our way. Because what do they want? What, what does this mean? Is it in opposition against a rule-based world? Is it against one person, one voice? Is it against or is it with uh, free media, free gathering, freedom of speech, etc.? I haven't heard any definition of this, but I know the definition of a free world and I stand behind those. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very clear uh, uh, plea. Um, now, let me turn to Roberta and ask you, does the EU have what it takes here in this whole thing? I mean, are we ready to become a global geopolitical player and to speak uh, uh, with Josep Borrell, to, uh, to, to speak the language of power? So, first of all, thank you, uh, Roland, for having me here. Nice to see uh, Alex uh, and Margareta and Noah um, joining us. So, whether we are ready or not, uh, whether we fully realize it or not, Europe is at the center of the geopolitical sand shifting that we are witnessing. Uh, and uh, it we need to accept that we are at the center of it, you know, from a pol political, geographical and economic perspective. You know, the European way of a steadfast belief in mixed economies, but to based on liberal democratic principles, is a model with which we can compete uh, in the world. And we have to be able to compete because having just listened to, to Alex and, and Margaret, and as we will continue to discuss, we're facing, you know, a very, very um, an exponentially increase in the strength of China. We have a disagreeable neighbor uh, in Russia. We have um, Belarus in boiling point. Uh, we have a rise of India. We have an uncertain UK to our north. We have a very unstable uh, southern Mediterranean. And talking about the United States, uh, it has not always proven to be reliable. Now, of course, we have a lot of hope in this current administration, also tangible cooperation, as we saw with the Airbus and, and Boeing agreement, but I think we would be naive to think uh, that Trumpism will not have long-lasting fallouts and that we will be feeling that uh, um, effect for a very long time. So I would not use this expected greater predictability uh, or safeguard as an umbrella for the future relations. You know, what is the Europe United States idea of what should be in Europe might not be the European Union's idea of what should be in Europe. And on this 
this, particularly on the position of Russia, we need to speak here uh, in a much stronger voice. So the answer to your question is, are we ready? I think it is complicated. Uh, and it is complicated also because sometimes we look at other continents speaking and being better prepared uh, in talking about generational terms while we are too busy trying to rebrand ourselves or trying to find words that match our policies rather than the, the other way around. You know, we hear of America first, we hear of Made in China 2025. 2025. We're sort of talking, are we, are we discussing sovereignty? Are we discussing strategic autonomy where we should be discussing the overarching themes that make Europe good? And let's look back at this year and see where we have done things that were unprecedented before when China was buying up our ports or, or, or coming into Europe with very advanced technological infrastructure, we uh, had to respond with an unprecedented amount of funds that will go into saving the face of Europe by calling it the next generation, by, uh, by adopting so much uh, programs that will be used for the generations by our children for years to come. But we were not ready to do that before the pandemic. We had to, to figure out what to do on, on COVAX. Let's also be proud to say that the European Union and Europe has been the largest donor of vaccines. We're talking about uh, a funding of facility of over 2.8 billion euros so far. And let's not call this vaccine diplomacy. This is our role in the world. And we actually carry it out with no strings attached because that's where Europe can actually stand up and be counted. Another point is I think we must realize that if the EU does not step up, other countries and other global players might do that. There might be other players more interested in creating tension, as we can see now, with irregular migration pressure on the Belarusian-Lithuanian border. What if Europe doesn't speak with one voice on that? What if Europe does not push back against any other player that is only interested in muzzling dissidents in Belarus, like Roman Protashevich? Here we spoke in a clear, united voice, but we need to do more of that. So there is the impression floating around that Europe is a little bit in between, you know, pushing for economic strength while being a human rights defense player. I don't think they are mutually exclusive. I think we need to consider ourselves being not caught up in the middle, but at the center. And once we recognize that role, then I think we can truly compete uh, with one voice across uh, um, uh, the world. But, but let me be a little bit more concrete here. I mean, how do we, what, what, what has to change in Europe so that we speak more with one voice? And that's a problem that, that, that several speakers already uh, uh, a, 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 a brought to, to our attention. Also, President Zorinda in his, in his introductory speech. Uh, so how do we uh, create more unity in, in EU foreign security policy, but also how do we shape up in technology? Uh, Europe uh, is, is not that great in innovating in the decisive areas of technological progress. <laughs> Yes, you are right. I mean, so far, I think Europe has taken a rather less fair approach uh, to seeing other countries rolling out AI infrastructure at a very strong pace. Uh, and I would definitely be the one <coughs> pushing for the national so-called recovery plans that at the moment are being discussed in the national parliaments that are essentially European money that needs to go to precisely those areas. Because the biggest tragedy would be if we fall back into our old ways, one once we emerge from this pandemic uh, into going back to being at a disadvantage, not having enough um, uh, impetus on research, on innovation, in, in making our young people that the first instinct of somebody who has entrepreneurial spirit is not to go to the United States, but actually find a home in the European Union to study, to work. And, as, and what President Zorinda said was correct, that we need to be able to look back at where we might not have succeeded where we even failed in the past, but let's not repeat those mistakes. It's the easiest thing to blame. Look, I work in the parliament. I represent uh, an, uh, an, an, an institution, a number of, of colleagues who say we need to, me to, to speak with one voice. Do we really speak with one voice? Are we strong enough to make sure that we push other players, uh, not only in Brussels, but also in other countries and their capitals, that for this we could actually lose if we do not speak with one voice with regards to Russia, with regards to China, with regards to what's happening 
in our neighborhood, then we will all lose. Our children will lose. And we, I think it's a matter of now or never. Uh, and we need to use, I think, the fact that the European Union stood up in difficulty over this past year. And we use that example in order to map how we work in the future. We have to be able to do it. And if we don't, I think we would have wasted not only time, resources, but billions of euros. And it would be on us, on our shoulders. Okay, sorry to be insisting here insist, on this, but insist as much qualified as majority voting. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've had several vetoes on, mm -hmm. on important foreign policy uh, questions, resolutions, declarations in the Council, in the, especially in the last couple of weeks. And we have the, the, a push towards qualified majority voting on uh, some foreign policy questions. Large countries tend to be in favor, small countries tend to be against. You come from Malta. What is your answer to this? My answer would be that the, the use of a veto as a threat is never the answer. But I would also not allow this to become an, a big country speak for everyone else. So I'm a little bit in the middle on this. I would not think that uh, removing the veto on such sensitive areas is necessarily going to solve the issue. But I would talk about negotiation, like we saw uh, in the past, where especially those countries on the periphery or those countries that feel that with in economic terms, there is a big coming together. Uh, when it comes to migration, there is no big coming together because we're talking about uh, human beings uh, and uh, a, a comfort of being far away from the problem. That is not going to be solved by vetoes. That is going to be solved by coming together and understanding that being around this table is that better than being outside of it. And this in a pro-Brexit, very sensitive scenario that we are living in. But again, you just mentioned something that, that we are currently haven't even discussed, but we are currently living through this conference on the future of Europe, a big word, but it doesn't have to be big. It can be really explained in what matters to each and every person living in each and every one of our countries. Uh, Alex mentioned before, you know, they don't know what the European Union is doing. I would say the same for most citizens in the European Union. Do they know what is happening? Do they know uh, what is being done and how this could affect their lives? But that's our responsibility, not only to communicate, but to listen and to understand what people want from us. So that's, you know, the big challenge we have. And it's not a matter of treaty, you know, changing and big words changing, but actually in practice, making a difference in everyone's lives. Thank you very much. Let me now turn to Noah Barkin, who's been listening patiently. And coming back to this uh, question of uh, relations between the European Union and China and the United States. And Noah, I'd like to ask you, uh, is a transatlantic consensus on a comprehensive China strategy possible? And comprehensive means including economic relations. And should we even aim for it? Back to Alexander's statement from the beginning. What is your take on this? Well, thanks, Roland, for having me. Hello to all my fellow panelists. I'm sitting in Berlin. I would rather be on a, in a cabin on a lake in Finland. That looks very nice over there, Alex. Um, but my vacations haven't started yet. Oh, Baltic Sea, I'm sorry. Um, can you see Nord Stream 2 from where you are? Uh, I would if it, if it was here. We're 80 kilometers from Estonia in that direction. OK. Um, so to, to get to your question, Roland, is a, is a transatlantic consensus on a comprehensive China strategy possible? I think some form of transatlantic consensus is possible. And we saw the emergence of that at the, at the G7 summit. If you look through the, the communique uh, that the leaders put out uh, earlier this month, there was agreement on a range of issues, human rights, uh, Taiwan, the need for an investigation into the origins of COVID-19. Um, the fact that China's uh, economic system, its state-driven capitalist system, is, poses real challenges for, for market economies. Um, so, uh, you know, and we've also seen the U.S., the Biden administration, uh, parroting the, US, uh, the EU language on, on China, this, this partner, competitor, systemic rival, the, the holy trinity. Um, so consensus, yes, uh, but I don't think we can realistically talk about a comprehensive uh, transatlantic strategy. And that's simply because, and Alex touched on this, um, you know, the U.S. and Europe view, view China through very different prisms. The U.S. is the incumbent superpower. It feels threatened by a rising China. 
It sees China not only as an economic competitor uh, with very different values, but also as a security threat. And let's face it, Europe does not feel threatened in the same way. It does share many of the same concerns uh, about the direction that China is heading in. Uh, but it has less skin in the game than the U.S. And importantly, it does not, it has not given up on the idea uh, of engagement with China in the way many in the U.S. have. I would push back against Alex's suggestion that the U.S. wants to disconnect completely. I think Donald Trump did give a few interviews that suggested that, but we have a new administration that I think is taking a more, a more nuanced view. Um, but uh, I, I think the biggest hurdle uh, to a common transatlantic uh, uh, China uh, policy is in the trade investment and technology sphere. Other Others have touched on this. You know, there is still appetite in the big European capitals for robust economic engagement with China. While in the U.S., the approach has been and I think is likely to continue to be more restrictive. We've seen, you know, a more aggressive use of export controls. We've seen bans on investment in certain Chinese uh, companies. And, and Europe is not on the same planet here. So I think finding a, finding a common transatlantic approach on the economic issues is going to be difficult. Uh, and, and I think there is, you know, we have to be honest, there is, there is potential for, for tensions there going forward. If the U.S. is putting uh, up hurdles for its firms in terms of engagement with China and the U.S. and the EU is not, uh, we are going to bash heads uh, at some point. So I would say that a broad consensus is possible. When you delve into the details, it gets more complex, uh, more contentious. And I think we are about to see uh, now that the EU and the US are really engaging uh, on China, you know, in, in a number of different formats, we're going to see how contentious it, it actually gets. Thank you, Noah. I, I still see a slight contradiction in the argument that uh, Europe should be economically independent of the U.S. and do its own China policy. And at the same time, you have even European business representatives like the F Federation of German Industry saying that precisely China's state capitalism is a threat to us, or even economically, let alone to our liberal democracy. And these were German entrepreneurs who said this. So, uh, bit, but we'll, we'll discuss this in the, in the remaining part of the debate. I would now like to turn to Anna with uh, the results of our Slido poll. Thank you, Roland. Yes, indeed, we do have the results of our poll. 65% of our viewers think that Europe's place should be firmly at the side of the US and other democracies. 24% think that it is complicated. And only 12% think that Europe's place is as independent third force outside of the US-China rivalry. I also have two questions from our online viewers that I'd like to leave with you. The first one is, the EU is having an internal debate on its own values. How can these values represent the basis for an effective foreign policy? The second question, is European strategic autonomy really the key to success or should the EU try to increase cooperation with countries such as Japan and India? Roland, over to you. Yes, uh, you know, I'd love to dish out all these, both of these questions to every speaker, but that's not going to work. Uh, so um, the, the, the question of allies such as Japan and, and maybe other countries of the Indo-Pacific, um, how about uh, to you, Alexander? Uh, what, what, how, how do you see this, this, this question of uh, possible allies uh, to America and Europe um, in other parts of the world, especially in Asia. Over to you, Alexander. Well, I mean, first of all, as predicted and actually really good, and in many ways, uh, uh, the type of a poll that uh, we would get in an EP pro land. Uh, and uh, I really, really like the um, sort of balanced approach of, of uh, NOAA on the whole package, uh, uh, sort of trying to find a broad consensus. And thirdly, I really felt strongly attached to Roberta's thesis about Europe being central. If starting point is that Europe is central, and that, of course, that we need to stick to our tradition. 
national alliances, uh, that of course is uh, China. Um, but I, I think we need to understand the ASEAN a little bit better when we deal with China as well. And we need to understand the role of China as a regional power uh, to be able to, how would I say, work in the region in a proper type of a way. We, you know, the, the, there are historic examples. I just listened to Walter Isaacson's uh, biography on Henry Kissinger, uh, and most of it is actually focused on one and the other hand on, on China. So, you know, we, we, we can't go in this uh, without understanding the complicated issues of the region. But yes, I would be looking for the types of allies that was, were mentioned in the question. That, and I would just uh, sorry, like to I'm add... low on batteries. Yeah, go ahead. That's okay. We get the message, yeah. Alexander. Um, uh, let me just emphasize this one point that, uh, in fact, when we talk about allies uh, among the democracies of Asia, for example, such as South Korea, uh, Japan, Taiwan, uh, India, uh, you know, we're also emphasizing that democracy is not reserved to uh, Europe and North America, that actually we're not talking about European values here, we're talking about universal values. And there is no reason to suspect that, uh, you know, it's somehow culturally impossible for Chinese to build a, a, a thriving uh, liberal democracy as the Taiwanese are proving uh, before our very eyes. Okay, let me, let me turn to the other question about values and the internal debate and turn to Margareta. Uh, it, it, uh, to what extent is the internal debate on values, societal values, LGBT questions, rule of law, to what extent is that weakening Europe's ability to actually play a global role and support democracy globally? Over to you, Margareta. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Roland. What I would like to say is... I don't think an open debate weaken Europe. I think the debate strengthens because if we really want to support uh, LGBT rights, if we want to support uh, ethnic minorities, if we want to support uh, freedom of religion and other values that's really important for a free society, we need as well to have the free and open debate without a debate just to be quiet i in my opinion it's this is the totally opposite this is what make a society less inclusiveness less, less acceptable and uh, i am very much pro the debate and openness that's the only way forward as i see it Indeed, thank you. Maybe, Roberta, you would like to come in on this very briefly? Yeah, I mean, I fully agree with what Margareta just said. Uh, it, this also is a question that is currently ongoing also with relations to Russia, you know, in terms of how different um, countries in the European Union see uh, whether you come to the table and discuss or not, uh, and if you do discuss, would that destabilize the unity or at the same time uh, create an alliance that there should, that shouldn't be with a, a player that is completely anathema to those values that have just been mentioned. Uh, but at the same time, do we look away? Uh, do we engage? Do we um, risk being painted as being hypocritical? Uh, sometimes where we close our eyes to things happening within our territory, uh, within our borders, uh, when we talk with authority to countries that are, uh, we want to partner up with. Do we uh, make a distinction, as the representatives of the German um, uh, industry said, between who is a, an economic competitor and who is uh, completely contradictory to what our human rights ideas respect that Europe was ultimately built from um, uh, are, are, are completely ignored or violated. And, and this is a discussion we have every day. Uh, and we need to have that debate. And that's why Margareta is right that the, the worst thing we could do is not to, to debate that. But I think on this, uh, the European Union has improved uh, since uh, I've, I've seen it sort of over the years that 
that there has been uh, this bigger propensity to speak a, a little bit more with, with one voice. I haven't mentioned Turkey yet. We know when we didn't how difficult that was. Uh, the fallout from what would otherwise have been, uh, let's say, a, a, a normal uh, run-of-the-mill meeting where the, 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 the lines were, 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 were drawn and, and the facts were made. As a result, we talked about optics. We talked about who talks in, in the name of who. Uh, that, those are uh, mistakes that we should avoid uh, rather than not engaging with those who are, let's say, sabre-rattling uh, at our borders. We saw, again, Turkey with, with, with Greece last year, using migrants as vulnerable geopolitical pawns in order to destabilize the external borders of Europe. A bit of a technical point, but it matters to uh, a very important uh, country in our union. And what are we doing? Why don't we speak with one voice? Why don't we alert when there are things that are, are, are not acceptable for us, why don't I speak when something is not acceptable for me? Uh, and I think that in the European Parliament where I currently sit, there is more of that. And I, I, I see that with, a, with, let's say, with pride uh, when looking back at how it was in the past. Indeed. Uh, Noah, let me, let me turn back to this uh, 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 mantra as it has become in Europe now of uh, China being our strategic partner on some issues, such as uh, climate change, for example, um, uh, China being an economic competitor and uh, a systemic rival. Uh, and I think it was uh, the, the chairman of the China delegation of the European Parliament, Reinhard Bütikofer, um, who said that, well, you can't really be a strategic partner on Monday, uh, an economic competitor on Tuesday, and a systemic rival on Wednesday. Uh, so, so, so here's my proposal, and I wonder whether you, you, you would subscribe to this, if we slightly change the grammar and the syntax of this whole statement and say that China is a systemic rival with whom we nevertheless have to cooperate on a few things. You know, one is the noun, the other is the verb, you know. The, the noun is what we are. We can't really change that. Uh, and we haven't picked the systemic rivalry. Uh, I mean, if, uh, long before the, uh, the use of that term by the European Commission uh, and, by the way, the, Federa the German Federation of Industries, which used systemic competitor. Uh, so long before that, we had a so-called document number nine by the Chinese Communist Party, which clearly defined the rule of law and uh, freedom of opinion as a systemic threat to the People's Republic. So if we say that we are systemic rivals and we can't change this for the moment, but what we do, what we can change is what we do with China. And there we have to select uh, cooperation here and maybe uh, a, a stronger pushback on, on different areas such as cyber attacks uh, against hospitals, for example, um, uh, such as, such as the, uh, uh, the wolf warrior diplomacy uh, and other acts of arm twisting and, and aggressive foreign policy. So, Noah, over to you. How do you see this whole thing about uh, 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 cooperation, competition, and pushback? Well, I think the beauty of this, uh, of this, uh, uh, these three terms is that one in Europe, uh, you know, a block of 27 different countries that uh, all can agree on, on, on this, uh, uh, on, on, on this sort of uh, division of, of uh, partner, competitor, and, and systemic rival. So I think when this was unveiled uh, a little over two years ago at a, uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the European Commission and, uh, uh, and the EEAS uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a joint communication, this was quite a, quite a step forward. I mean, the, the use of the term systemic rival had never uh, been used before, and uh, by European, uh, yeah, by European uh, comparisons, that that was uh, sort of the language of of power. But I think what we're seeing is that it's becoming more and more difficult to to compartmentalize uh, the relationship. Uh, we saw that with uh, you know in December when. The EU sealed this political agreement on the invest, uh, political agreement on investment deal with China, um, and then a few months later, imposed human rights sanctions on 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 uh, fairly targeted and limited human rights sanctions on officials in Xinjiang. 
Um, and, and China hit back, and now that investment uh, agreement is, is sort of in tatters. So I, I think it is going to become increasingly difficult to, to keep these three uh, terms alive. I mean, when you talk about partnership, when you're talking about climate, uh, people also talk about non-proliferation, biodiversity. It's becoming thinner and thinner the number of the number of topics in the in the in the partnership basket. And some people question whether uh, climate should even be defined as as partnership. That that's also an area is going to increasingly be an area of of competition in green technologies, etc. Um, so uh, I think I agree with you, Roland, that we're sort of shifting more in the direction of uh, systemic rivalry. But I think there are there are vested interests, uh, certainly in the capital that I'm sitting in, Berlin, uh, who uh, are very wedded to the, the partnership side of the equation. So I, I don't expect the EU to uh, uh, to depart from this. But I think the key question is the bat how you strike the balance and. Uh, you know, even even the U.S. is using or is using these three three terms now. But I but I think the the balance in the U.S. is is certainly different than it is here in the EU. All right, thank you. And um, uh, I think we should we should maybe come back to the economic dimension here and the the very uh, uh, very stark complaints even of European enterprises, about copyright violations, about state-owned enterprises which can always compete with more, um, uh, more of a capital base against uh, private companies in the West that have to raise their capital themselves. Um, uh, and, and of course the whole question of um, of dumping prices, uh, then also, of course, the question of what kind of uh, conditions are there for the use of labor, such as, for example, in Xinjiang. And uh, so taking all this together, is any one of you, and I'm asking all four of you, is any one of you convinced that Europe would do better on its own negotiating with China on these issues, or should we seek a common stance with the United States before we uh, address China and try to to address precisely these issues of, you know, telling the Chinese that, listen, I mean, we, 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 competition is not possible under the conditions which you have created, for example, with state-owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. And Roberta, over to you. Yeah, you you know, your your question threw me back uh, to, you know, eight years ago when we had uh, Obama presidency and administration. And there, I think there was um, various uh, attempts, um, some more successful than others, to create this global coalition, you know, uh, with uh, with a sort of horse trading between the EU and the United States on, on, on various parts of the world. I think it's a little bit may perhaps uh, I would say early to know whether we have a stable partnership with the United States. Um, uh, I think there is, you know, there are good, let's say, ho give, things that give us hope, like what we have saw with Biden's first act on, on the Paris Agreement uh, and what Noah mentioned, you know, this forever sort of decreasing list of things we can find uh, commonalities on uh, but it's ultimately about leadership uh, and if you have the political will to get together and push back against a competitor uh, but that is also recognizing that you are in itself and in, in, in ourselves each other's competitors between the US and the EU but also uh, w w with Japan uh, and, and other countries and India among others but understanding that that would actually push back on uh, on what we are seeing uh, in China with the practices that are that are unacceptable to us, but still that are happening and they are being very felt uh, by our industries, by our our economies. So I think that there needs to be this 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 in, in renewed impetus for that to happen. The, the role that the United Kingdom will play is also very important, uh, as we saw a couple of weeks ago, where you see nuances which you'd, saw, you'd see before, but at the time UK was inside the European Union. But make no mistake, that is also something we need to keep an eye out, that this is, again, is the EU going to be competing with the UK uh, in this area? And in that case, where will the US, um, uh, who will the US partner up with and who is the strong man, so to speak, on the table? That's our 
our responsibility and our challenge ultimately. Okay, and let me let me. We have just seven and a half minutes left. Um, let me bring up uh, one last important point here, and that's the the, the, the Russian-Chinese couple, as well, as I may call it. And again, referring to Sergei Wavrov's article of yesterday, um, w where he completely sees both Russia and China in the lead of a global pushback against Western arrogance and and supremacy and so on. So. I mean, let's remember Henry Kissinger in the 1970s. You remember he, he, he strategically advised President Nixon to basically kiss and make up with China in order to drive a wedge between the communist powers of the era, which were the Soviet Union and the People's Republic, and, uh, 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 you know, with, with, with a huge uh, uh, and for many painful change of uh, uh, attitudes uh, uh, between the US and the People's Republic and, and a recognition and all this. Um, it seems like the stunt worked to, a, to an extent. Now, some people today are advising a reverse Kissinger, as I would call it. In other words, trying to make some steps towards Russia in order to somehow pry Russia away from the partnership with the People's Republic of China. And Alexander, I'm looking at you. Um, President Macron seems to also uh, uh, be an adherent of this, uh, of this strategy. How realistic is this in your view? And to what lengths should the West or maybe the European Union go to actually accommodate Russia and somehow give it more incentives to, uh, to, to move away from China? Over to you, Alexander. Oops, we lost the connection, I think. No, there you are. Um, no, let me, no, let me turn to Noah uh, with this question. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay, um, Alexander, yeah, with thanks. the connection um, is bad. To fill that old charger. Oh. No, yeah, yeah. Uh, I found an old charger and I... Should I go ahead and answer? Yes, Noah, go ahead. Alexander, wait a second. Noah, go ahead. Yes. Well, you're absolutely right, Roland. Uh, Emmanuel Macron has been talking about this for a couple of years and, and been uh, uh, sharply criticized. And I think um, uh, he, he's now, he, he wasn't very amused by all the praise that uh, Biden received uh, for meeting uh, uh, Putin earlier this month. Um, uh, when, he, when he was criticized for this idea. But I think if, if, you, uh, if you look at, if you go from the assumption that uh, China is and will be foreign policy priority number one, two, and three uh, for Washington in the coming decades, which, which I think is true, um, you have, if, if you think further ahead, I, I, I think we will see uh, attempts by uh, the U.S. to reach out uh, to Moscow. I think the, the problem is that uh, under Vladimir Putin, uh, no one is under any illusions that, that this is going to be successful. Now, uh, I've forgotten when uh, Mr. Putin leaves office. I think it's um, sometime in the in the in the mid 30s. Um, so we may be, it may be a, 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 it may be a long wait. But uh, but I think this We're is lucky. something that is going to be coming back again and again. Um, we are going to see an attempt by Washington uh, to reach out. The only question is, uh, will, will will Russia uh, will, will they be able to to have a have a conversation with Russia? Okay, Margareta, uh, isn't the systemic uh, uh, difference between the West and Russia and China on the other side so strong that uh, they will always recognize the West as an existential threat and therefore are, are kind of stuck with each other? Um, or do you see, do you see any future uh, dissension, dissension between uh, Beijing and Moscow? Well, I would say there is a competition between uh, Russia and China, yes, because it's uh, two uh, countries with a totally different uh, totalitarian system. It doesn't mean that they cooperate. I could also see that there is a 
competition. We could see it both when it's come, not that much when we see on trade, but we could see it in investment uh, where there is a huge uh, competition. We could see it in the Arctic region where there is uh, both Russia and China is there and they are have a, a very strong competition about research, about uh, in investment, about uh, the land. We could see it in Central Asia, where there is as well a competition between China and uh, Russia, who will make uh, the most outcome. I could see how Russia tried to connect the Central Asia country in the Euro Asia, Asia, Asian uh, economic union, I could see the military connections, I could see how China tried to invest, uh, how China tried to build the Silk Road, for example. So there is a competition. I don't say that there is not a competition. And I could also see that uh, there is the competition towards European Union. But uh, I am a very strong believer in, uh, in the rule-based world, in market economy, in uh, the fundament believe of the fundamental rights and that's why i think that uh, we have a much better position in the U europe than we in both russia and china have and uh, but we have to take care about this of course it's not that uh, we will always have this we have also to build on our system and our values invest in them thank you thank you and so much enough Thank you. Thank you. And I would like to actually close uh, on this optimistic note uh, with the, the, the main takeaway that if we talk about transatlantic relations and China, that a consensus on certain strategic, a strategic core of, uh, uh, of, of, of points, of policies is possible and desirable. Uh, and that the second note referring to this uh, uh, question of past and future that I referred to several times uh, uh, over the debate. Um, you know, I mean, a hundred years ago, the West seemed to be finished. You know, uh, the West seemed to, the, the, the democratic capitalism looked old and tired and uh, actually belonging to the past compared to those big new uh, totalitarian uh, collectivist movements that were that seemed to be so futuristic at the time and huge. you know and that was and, and then came Hitler and came Stalin and and then came actually the best right that liberal democracy has ever had in world history so you know the West has this uh, capacity you know surprising to many and annoying to its detractors of bouncing back when you least expect it and I think that should uh, keep us optimistic in this indeed systemic rivalry uh, uh, that we're living through. And uh, if we really take care and if we plan our moves correctly and work with our allies, we can uh, prevail in this uh, conflict of the era. So I would like to thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Roberta, here in the thank studio. You. Thank, thank you, you, Alexander, uh, Margareta and Noah uh, online. And uh, thank you all for watching, for participating with your questions and the poll. And over to you, Anna. Thank you, Roland and panelists, for such a great and interesting discussion.